Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're going to review what have been the results of COP26, which ended on some positive and some negative note. Look, if you look at what has been happening, particularly after the Paris Agreement, which itself was a problem, but after which we had the additional problem of President Trump walking out of it, taking the biggest problem of the global uh, warming issue, the United States out of the Paris Agreement, Biden coming back, how do we see at the, this agreement? Is it a step beyond Paris? Is it a step below Paris? Or is it something which is potentially still to be realized? And we hope for something better in the future, but at least it has opened the discussions again. Yeah. Uh, my assessment is that it's a marginal step forward from Paris. Uh, if you go by the narratives of uh, uh, the UK, uh, which were the hosts of this meeting, Boris Johnson and his minister, Alok Sharma, or uh, if you listen to President Biden or John Kerry in particular, his climate envoy, you'd think this has been a major achievement. Uh, in Glasgow. I suppose that's to be expected. The host will always say that he's uh, had a good party, uh, but one should ask the guests uh, what they thought of the event. And if you judge by the outcome uh, in concrete terms, there's only, I think, three major concrete achievements that one can speak of. One is by cajoling and pressuring, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with additional commitments by various uh, uh, countries, you've managed to reduce the gap. Uh, you're now looking at a potential temperature rise of 2.4 degrees Celsius instead of 2.7, which was the position before Glasgow. Now that is a minor achievement, yes, but it's not a great achievement in view of the fact that you want to reach 1.5. The second achievement I think is that for the first time, in whatever imperfect a manner, fossil fuels and coal have actually made an appearance as terms in the uh, Glasgow uh, Pact, which till now all the agreements have spoken loosely in terms of reducing emissions. The third is that there has been some small incremental gain in the promise of adaptation funding, which the developed countries have promised to double uh, by 2025 compared to what they had said earlier. But as I said, these are all incremental uh, changes offset by huge negatives. If I take the last one, the pledge of $100 billion a year, which they have now said we will double by uh, 2025, is still a promise. It was mentioned first in the in Paris itself in 2015, later reiterated in 2019, now promised in Glasgow, but now they have said this will start in 2023. So that's a big loss uh, in terms of this. And as I said, the temperature rise is only 2.4. No major uh, uh, emission reduction promises by the developed uh, countries. I think that's been the biggest loss uh, in this, that the main agenda and action points emphasized in COP26 have been the agenda points pushed by the developed countries. And if we had heard the closing remarks of more than 20, 25 countries we heard representing much larger groups, group of 77 and Africa, least developed country grouping, the island states, all of them said we are very unhappy with the statement, but we have to get some statement at the end of this. So let's look at the positive side and let's go forward. You talked about the developed countries not meeting their uh, whatever promises they had made. In this particular case, we did talk about what are the emission cuts what are the various things countries would do. But the promise of money is only going to be discussed next year in terms of commitments. And the 
fact that they have made again another promise of doubling the non-existent funds which they had promised earlier, that itself still raises question that people are, asked, are being asked to commit to cuts of yes. either emissions or future emissions. Yes. But the ones who have the money, they are not being asked to produce the money right now. So Absolutely. this delinking of the two itself is a big issue as far as uh, this agreement is concerned. Absolutely. And that's why I said the developed countries have been allowed to get away with their agenda setting. The uh, least developed countries and the island uh, states have been focused this time far more on adaptation funds and on loss and damage funds. And they have not pushed as much as they have done in earlier COPs on mitigation and reducing temperatures. This suits the developing, uh, the developed countries, because so long as you keep talking about money and dangling some money in front of you, they can keep you enticed uh, with the promise of money and they can postpone other decisions, making you believe, well, if not today, tomorrow, we will give you the money. And I think that has been a bit of a, a problem in the way negotiations have been conducted by overemphasizing the financing uh, aspects, we have lost out on the mitigation targets in the uh, COP26 negotiations. When you come to mitigation targets, when you talk of 2.4 degrees, it might not appear to be such a big number, except for the fact that this is an average global temperature rise. Even on this 1.1 degree rise, which is what we have already reached, you saw temperatures like 45 to 50 degrees over North America, Canada, something that you had never seen before. So right. already extreme weather events is also rocking, not only the rest of the globe, but also the developed countries who thought being cold countries, they were not going to suffer from global warming. They now see also that that's not true. But nevertheless, this 2.4 degrees, 2 degrees, actually do not tell us the full picture because it, rice is what you see as the highest temperature that you might see. And if it rises in parts of the tropics by three to four degrees, which is what is likely to happen in summer then with the 2.4 degrees average, you are likely to send the actual, make it in uninhabitable. In fact, the average global rise of temperature is only one indicator of a much wider uh, multi-dimensional process of climate change. Because what we have witnessed now is not just a global average temperature rise of 1.1 degree Celsius. It's also resulted in more frequent storms. It's resulted in uh, forest fires. Uh, it's resulted in large scale drought uh, covering most of the southern United States. So we must remember climate change is a multi-dimensional phenomenon. And if we are seeing these scale of uh, climate changes at 1.1 degrees Celsius, the mind boggles at what uh, kind of changes we are likely to see if temperatures rise crosses two degrees or more. Also, some of the other problems which have not come to light in this discussion is the fact that while renewables are the obvious way to go, the problem you have is, of course, the daily storage, which you can handle with what would be called batteries. Yes. But when it comes to seasonal variations, as we saw, for instance, in Germany, that they had to up their fossil fuel consumption because right. stilling of the winds led to much lower wind generation. Right. That renewables also need seasonal backups, and Absolutely. that the world does not seem to be prepared for. And Absolutely. those are technological issues still to be solved. But again, there does not seem to be so much of discussions on these issues. And the, so, there is a techno optimism. Somehow, batteries, and particularly because Mr. Tesla keeps on, Elon Musk keeps on talking about batteries, which he doesn't yeah. produce, but right. keeps on talking about them is somehow obfuscating the market benefits certain companies seek to achieve from the real hard 
technical and techno economic decisions we need to take i think that's absolutely correct in terms of the uh, power generation uh, which as you know uh, contributes about 75% of the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, that we are talking about but there is another side effect to this you've already spoken about the technical limitations uh, of phasing out fossil fuels that's easier said than done uh, so in a sense what has been made a big fuss of uh, at the last leg of the uh, uh, glasgow conference that india said look phasing out is a problem if you talk about that and therefore a compromise language of phasing down uh, was introduced the basic issue is however that even the phasing out language didn't set a timeline but i think there should have been an emphasis on the fact that whether you phase down or phase out uh, one will lead to the other uh, you can't phase out without phasing down uh, that's fair enough but both of them will require a lot of other technological adjustments in terms of production of uh, electricity storage of electricity diurnal across as well as uh, seasonal and these need to be taken into account and they need to be far more technical inputs into this the second aspect is i think because of the emphasis on uh, the power generation part of this there has been less emphasis on all the other things that you can do uh, in terms of emissions uh, reduction now they are part of this 25% that do not come under the power generation emissions but they are important when we are talking about a couple of uh, uh, points of uh, uh, degree celsius this way or that way they make a difference for instance the methane pledge which is a not a documented formal pledge it's an informal agreement by country saying we'll reduce methane by 30% uh, by 2030 this is expected to contribute a drop of about 0.2 to 0.3 degrees celsius now that looks very small but when you are talking about the difference between 1.5 and let's say 1.8 or the difference between 2.4 and 2.1 0.3 makes a big difference you know coming back to this issue about what you call about methane you know there's also about coal one important issue is that europe as well as united states has chosen gas as the intermediate fuel that's right from coal to gas and then from gas to renewables as their okay. route it's only india and china who do not have access right. to gas is right. and right. they have large reserves of coal therefore the problem is not identical for both in fact Absolutely. that is one of the reasons india had a problem and even china and the us talked about phase down they didn't talk about phase out but if you look at that that if gas is not an intermediate fuel for india for example then of course the issue is different and yeah. methane in fact in india would be more agriculture as well as livestock unlike those which have a large gas infrastructure whether it's russia whether it's west asia or it's united states which does a lot of fracking so Quite in right. fact the methane emissions are really more concentrated Quite on these on these issues right. but coming back to what you have said that the technology part of it in fact in fact that is a weakness that we see that we have focused too much on only the emissions and not to the technology side and we have assumed that if money is available technology is available and okay. it's interesting that africa how does it make the transition or does it not make the transition at all because it is still infrastructure has not been built and infrastructure will need large amounts of energy investment they have access to oil and gas but the way the whole discussion is going norway which wants to expand its gas is moving resolution saying no finance finances should be made available to africa for gas so yes. those are very unfortunate directions we seem absolutely. to be taking absolutely what is good for us is not good for you absolutely issues absolutely so that way we don't seem to see these issues come to the fore in cop 26 absolutely absolutely the only the only 
example that one can think of where a different route has been taken it was in South Africa, which has been promised money to phase out coal in an accelerated uh, manner. But even there, the source of the alternative uh, source of generating electricity has not been mentioned. Some positives of the agreement from what you say, but unfortunately very much teetering on the balance. And so is global climate change from negotiations to what is likely to happen. Yeah. A small word on India before we leave, yeah. uh, I think, uh, and that is India has not just not covered itself uh, in glory at the end of this uh, COP. Of course, the India blaming by the uh, uh, developed world, uh, if you see most of the Western media, it was India which has been cast as the villain uh, of the Glasgow uh, summit. It's not so much, I think, because of the position India took but of the way in which India has conducted its negotiations throughout the Glasgow uh, summit. You had the prime minister come first and make a series of uh, announcements, which are actually quite significant uh, emission reduction announcement, particularly when you compare it with the very poor emission reduction commitments by the US and several other developed uh, countries. He makes these statements, makes no mention of any conditionalities or anything. Then suddenly the Indian delegation says, all this is, uh, yes, very good, but this is all conditional upon India getting $1 trillion uh, of uh, financing. So it was extremely bad. And then to have this last minute drama, 24 hours extension, the minister on his return has written a blog where he has spoken of the Indian position and talked of how it has put forward the opinion and views of the developing countries as a whole. Unfortunately, on the floor of the plenary, none of the developing country groupings, the Africa group, G77 and China group, least developing countries group, island states, none of them have supported this position. India was left uh, uh, alone to feel this uh, position not done well at all and i feel many countries would feel that india has conducted these negotiations not just badly but in bad faith so i think indian performance in this except for the initial announcement that was done the rest of it has been downhill uh, all along the way what you mean is that the announcements made by the prime minister was either not worked out with the delegation that was there properly. They were as uh, surprised by the delegations, uh, by the announcement as other delegations, or that it was thought to be uh, appropriate to delink the two to, in a way that prime minister covers himself with the glory while the in glory comes to the delegation, not to the PA. But yeah. unfortunately, unfortunately. The globe doesn't see it as that. No, doesn't see it as uh, India, and right. therefore, it, whatever whatever brownie points we might exactly. have won by exactly. the initial declarations, we exactly. have at the end of it lost most of that, if not all. most of that, most of the goodwill, and we have particularly lost again uh, goodwill of the developing countries, which is why the president of the COP, Alok Sharma, finally uh, even said that India and China, he said, would have to explain themselves to these countries. But that's a bad faith declaration by Mr. Sharma as well. Considering Johnson, Mr. Prime Minister Johnson was promising a new coal mine in yep. the UK Absolutely. very recently. Absolutely. But the point is they would like to turn the divisions exactly. between India, China and others while exactly. they are on the sidelines. And exactly. completely disavow their historical responsibility, which still shows the largest Absolutely. amount of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere come from this few Absolutely. countries, the rich countries. Absolutely. So anyway, Raghu, thanks for being with us. This is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and do visit our website.